can't see back there. I'll put my thumb up and maybe those, if you can see. Aha, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we want to really uh, honor our time and want to thank you all uh, for being here. And uh, we'll, we will begin, I guess I'm supposed to say, as a committee meeting, the Teaching Learning Committee meeting is officially started for June the 4th. We have a pretty uh, packed agenda today. We have some updates um, on several of uh, areas, fine arts, career technology, and the choice. Uh, process for this year, so as well as 21st century. That's a written update, so I would encourage folks to um, to, to read that one. So we'll get started with the uh, with the fine arts update. Do we have those folks here? Okay, then if it's all right, I may switch that, and we'll since I do know that someone is here for choice, correct? So let's start with the, with the middle and high school choice since you've been sitting here, sir. If that's good. Yes. Actually, um, I met him here when I walked in, so thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dominic Bivens. I'm from the Office of Enrollment Choice and Transfer. Um, I'm here to talk to you guys this afternoon in regards to the um, annual high school and middle school choice results for the 1920 school year. Um, we're going to talk about the process, participation, and the results of the choice process, and then some of the strat choice strategies that we've implemented this year to support families through this process, um, particularly our middle school families and um, our families coming from closing schools. Um, and then finally, um, what enhanced supports we have for the next year and going forward through the um, choice process. Um, so the way that um, middle and high school choice works is we have um, choice liaisons that are trained by myself um, here in the district office to support, and we have one in every school, and their job is to support families and help them navigate the middle and high school choice process. <clears throat> we also have open house and shadow days at our different middle and high school's choice sites for families to visit to learn more about the school. Additionally, we release a um, guide every year um, that outlines our schools and programs that we offer through our choice process, as well as an annual choice fair um, that we put on for families to come and learn about the schools that we have throughout the district. Um, on the application, students rank their choices and can list up to five choices, and we use a matching algorithm to place students at the highest possible choice according to their ranking. And over the past several years, this has um, led us to place at least 70 to 75 percent of our students at their first or second choice. Um, this year, the high school particip um, the participation rate for high school choice has been in line with previous years. We've had about 92 percent of students participate of eligible students participate in the process. Um, the results have also been um, in line with previous years. Again, 70 percent of students were placed at their first or second choice. Um, we did have a slightly higher number this year of unplaced students. This is, was due to um, closing schools and um, student, families making other choices, such as charter schools or schools with an interview or audition process that would not be part of the school choice process. Um, for middle school, it's a slightly different story. As you guys can see, um, the application um, so we've received and the participation rate has been steadily de decreasing over the past five years. Um, so this year was 70% um, of student eligible students that um, participated in a um, choice process for that first round. And 
And as we look at the assignments um, based on preference, um, it's about 65, 64 students that um, were placed in their first or second choice. But we had over 25% of our students that um, participated in the process that did not receive a placement. Um, Again, this is due to the redu um, reduction in the number of options, middle school options that we have available through the choice process, um, as well as family selecting those advanced academic programs and not qualifying. So those are just a few of the factors that lead to that um, high number of unplaced students. And. Um, in regards to that composite score piece, so for Roland Park, um, which is one of our more popular advanced academic programs through the middle school choice, the um, cut score was 385, um, as opposed to the qualifying score of 355. So you, the lowest score to receive a seat at Roland Park the, um, for the 1920 school year was a 385. Um, and also with City and Poly, Poly, the lowest score to receive a seat was a 708, and for the city, it was a 687. Um, when we look at middle school students, um, we have, we, <clears throat> we place our middle school students in priority groups, priority one and priority two. Priority one fifth graders are fifth graders that do not have a zone middle school or a sixth grade seat, which is why we have them participate in this process. Um, priority two students are those students that are at a, um, usually at a K to eight that have a zone, or, I'm sorry, that have a sixth grade seat, but can still participate in this process. Um, on here, uh, we have the available middle school seats. Um, so we placed about a thousand students in, um, through the middle school choice process with 1140, um, 1140 seats that were available. Um, the thing with that, though, is that um, some of those seats are, are advanced academic seats, and those seats sometimes go to priority two students. So that 1140 is not necessarily the seats for all of our priority one fifth graders, which we have about 1,600 of those students. So. One of the things we've done is expand the seats at some of our middle school sites, um, but we're, we still haven't reached that number to capture those 1,600 students. Also, um, like I said earlier, a lot of students go to a charter school or opt to go to a K-8, to um, which is highlighted in this next slide. Um, one of the um, groups that we have in looking at the middle school choice process and looking at how we can make it more effective for families um, we looked at the number of students <clears throat> that participate in the process and then where they wind up um, when the school starts the next following school year. And as you can see, there's been a steadily, steady decline of students that received a placement through the choice process of middle school students that kept that seat as a sixth grader in the new school year. Um, Back in 2016-17, it was about 683 students that kept their seat. This past school year, it was about 379 students that were placed through the choice process and that stayed at that seat. Um, if you look at that first chart, you can also see um, that more and more of our students, priority one fifth graders, um, are opting to attend um, what we call zone K to eights. So the number of students attending choice sites is decreasing while that number of students that are going to those zone K to eight schools is increasing. Um, this year, um, the board approved the closing of five schools, including one school that um, is part of the choice process that would be Banneker Blake. Um, this resulted in about 1300 students um, being part of our closing school or relocating school process. Um, for placement for the 1920 school year. Um, the impact of families from this process, they um, received notification about the process as well as we had um, 
information fairs where we um, let families come and find out about the different neighboring schools and learn more information about them so that they could um, remain in the district and look at some of the other viable options that we have in the district. Um, as part of our communication support for families, we've um, prioritized targeting early, um, targeting students earlier in the process, so not waiting until they get to the fifth and eighth grade to find out about the choice process, but making sure that our choice liaisons and as a district, we're letting families know earlier and often about the process so that they could be prepared for their participation in the process. Um, we've also, um, looked at schools to promote the different academic and extracurricular activities to families to make their schools more attractive for families to come and um, attend those schools, as well as leveraging our community-based organizations to um, make families aware of the process. Um, for our early engagement, we have milestones we want families to um, focus in on as their, as their child is going through school, um, particularly at the third and sixth grade. We want them to start researching school choice options, as well as develop an understanding of their child's grades and attendance and how those test scores determine the um, options that they have to participate in the process. And then by fourth and seventh grade, because um, we know as it relates to the composite score, that there is um, the majority of the score comes from those two grades, making sure that families know who the choice liaison is and that they um, that families develop an understanding of what their child is interested in and what their goals are so that they can make a more informed decision for the process. <clears throat> this is um and this is our typical um, timeline that families go through as they participate in the choice process where we have our information sessions um, beginning in October and going throughout the year. Um, our choice guides and the applications and the composite scores, all that becomes available to families um, mid-November, December. We have our choice fair um, that first um, Saturday in December. In January, our applications are due, and then um, by March, families find out where their child has been placed. In regards to our choice liaisons who support um, us in this process of making sure families are informed about the um, middle and high school choice process, we facilitated multiple training and engagement opportunities for those choice liaisons, um, as well as launching a, train, um, a training module on TSS for school-based staff to access um, to learn more information about the process. As moving forward, these are kind of the buckets that we're going to be looking at um, as we collaborate with each other to make this process more effective and um, equitable for families. Looking at engagement supports and what leverages we can use through the community and through our schools to help families navigate the choice process. <laughs> Um, the, and these are some of the initiatives going forward that we're looking at um, as it relates to making the process more equitable for students. Looking at some demand modeling um, for our schools and zones and how that affects students' choice. Um, expanding our middle grade options. Like I said earlier, we expanded the number of seats at some of our middle school sites, but also looking at expanding um, the, just the number of options and not just the number of seats that we have available for families as well. Um, and as well as, you know, reviewing the district portfolio for our various schools. Uh, so any other questions or concerns, um, you can visit the website, um, baltimorecityschools.org, um, to find out more about choice or contact um, Chief Hike Hubbard um, in regards to the process or myself. All right. Thank you.
I'm sure I know we have questions. <laughs> I'm curious. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. Um, I want to know a little bit, on slide eight, um, we talk about, or we see some, we see, we see this decrease in the participation rate among all eligible students. Can you talk to me about that? The decline has been pretty consistent since 2015, 2016. Um, so, yes, so. so if a student does not, um, because there are students that have to um, participate in the process, um, so can you talk to me about it? Another question that I have with it is what happens to a student if they don't participate in that process? Yes. Um, so it, your first question in regards to the gradual decrease, um, when the process, when we first started this process, the formal process of the choice process, we had about 20 middle school sites for families to choose from. In addition to our five advanced academic sites, we now have seven um, sites for families to choose from in addition to the five academic sites. So that's part of, to me, that's been part of the, a large part of the decrease in the participation rate. Also, um, families that don't participate in this process, they may have um, opted to go to a school where there's an interview process or to a charter school where there's a lottery. And so those students participating in that process wouldn't be counted in this number of students participating in this process because the charter schools all, you know, operate separately from city schools in regards to um, admissions. Um, your second question in regards to students that don't receive a placement, um, this month our office um, works with schools to ensure that all of our students are placed. And so what typically happens is we wind up having to assign those students that did not receive a placement through the choice process. But they're given an opportunity during our summer transfer window to select other placement options. Um, so are they given a school that's in their, their, in their geographical? Yeah, so yeah, we look at their um, where the family is located and make a placement based off of that um, and where seats are available. Just to follow up on that, because I'm assuming that one of the reasons that the one, the one number went down was the fact that we were growing K to eights. So, it, I mean, am I correct on that one? In turn, you were saying at one time we had 20 middle school selections, mm -hmm. and now we're. So some people are just opting to just go through their it's regular K to eight. Yes, yeah, it's, it's been my experience that a lot of our families just that are at a K to five would just prefer to be transferred to a K to eight and prefer that setting as to the middle school and middle high okay. options that we offer through the choice prof, uh, process. Okay. So that's another contributing factor. You're okay. correct in that. I have a few other questions, but I'll reserve them for the sake of our time for uh, maybe I'll submit them before our next board meeting. I do have um, uh, something to ask about the feedback from our parents and community about the engagement process. Um, have we received feedback? Is there a formalized feedback um, process for parents, students, and community members um, in regards to the choice process? And are we using that information to inform our practice and the improvement of the choice process? There's always room to improve. Absolutely. Um, so um, last year, a year before, there was a um, study done by the Fund for Educational Excellence. And um, through that fund, there was data and feedback gathered around how families were experiencing the choice process. Um, and so we've used that data to inform um, changes into this process. For example, um, this year was the first year that we had the, um, on the choice application available online, and that was feedback that we were getting from families. So now that option is available for families to access through the parent portal and um, complete a choice application. Um, we've also been working with um, choice liaisons and collecting that feedback. So the families will provide that feedback to the choice liaisons, and then they provide that um, to district office for us okay. to make our informed decisions about, you know, how we can enhance this process. Is there a formalized um, evaluation that or feedback process that parents and students can do that we can use internally, consistently, to kind of inform our work? 
Um, no, but that's certainly a good idea that um, I'll take back to my office so that we can have that for the next year and include it as part of our process. I think it'll be helpful. I think yeah, so I think too. That's, that's helpful, and I think certainly as now uh, Chief Hyde Cupboard is in place, it's the kind of thing that would be really helpful to have help her as she's, you know, learning the landscape to get some feedback and some sense of how it's going. Absolutely. I appreciate it. And finally, uh, Madam Chair, I just want to continue to kind of push the idea of expanding middle school options. Um, so that we can have more attractive um, programs for our young people to actually apply to. Um, I think that's just something that we just really have to wrap our brains around as a district, making sure that middle school is an attractive um, part of the educational experience here in city schools. So that's just something that I, I just want to add and comment to, because I think we could probably increase the amount of folks that are eager to um, complete the choice process at the middle school level if we actually had innovative programs at the middle school level that were attractive to families. No, that's absolutely right. And it's definitely something that um, Dr. Santelisis has talked a lot about and making sure that our middle schools have the kinds of programming that anybody would want for their middle school or like world language, access to world language and um, access to science and math and you know challenging programs, honors programs and algebra and so on. And so we are working on that. And there's a, a team who's been looking at middle school, but um, we, we still have a, a long way to go in terms of how we um, um, you know, to make sure that across the city there's a range of options that families feel good about. Because we do lose a lot of families at middle school. We um, gain a lot of families back at, um, at high school, but middle school is, is an area where it's still a challenge. Um, I, I want to mention just one in that area in terms of additional options, and I know that they exist, and it seems as though it would, it would be a great pipeline for us, and that's the International Baccalaureate. We have, I know, at least two middle schools that use the middle years program, but I don't see them as one of, as options, and I know they're K to, they're K to eight schools. And so that may be one of the areas um, to look at, which would be great um, pipelines for students that might be interested in, in the program that's at City College. Um, you know, I know we have I know we have a couple of early years from the elementary, but what we have in place for people who might be interested in that is one of those pathways. No. Thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you. you for being here early today. Too. No Thanks. problem. <laughs> so now that I've adjusted, I need to go back and see. Okay, so we're going to go back to uh, and do the fine arts update. Good afternoon, Ashley Cook, Director of Literacy, Language, and Culture, and we apologize for our tardiness. Good afternoon, Chanel Howard, Coordinator for Fine Arts, and I concur and second um, Director Cook's apology for lateness. Ms. Ms. Howard, I know you have a mic, but I'm going to ask if you sort of use your um, playground voice, voice a bit because there is a fan or whatever that's, that's adding to the noise in the room. Thanks. Is this better? Use my teacher voice? Awesome. Good afternoon, everybody. Since 2012, a collective, a collection of concerned artists, organizations, and educators have worked collectively to raise public awareness of the issues contributing to inequity with a specific emphasis on fine arts. Through data collection, annual presentations to the school board, op-eds, and public events, their efforts resulted in increased district and public awareness, but not in actual systems change. Baltimore Arts Education Coalition was formed under, thank you, Baltimore Arts Education Coalition was formed under the previous CEO of Baltimore City Public Schools, Dr. Greg Thornton, circa 2014. The main function of the coalition was to examine how arts education opportunities were offered to the students within city schools. Between 2015 and 2017, several conditions changed to make systems change more possible. One, President Obama's administration introduced the Every Student Succeeds Act, requiring states to provide every student with a well-rounded education that includes the arts and music. Two, revisions to the Code of Maryland Schools regulations closed loopholes within the requirement 
for local districts to provide every child with an instructional program in visual art, music, dance, theater, and media arts. While this regulation remains an unfunded state mandate, the revisions and reporting requirements help bring district attention to the changes. Baltimore City Public Schools hired CEO Dr. Santelisis, who brought a pragmatic and collective, collaborative approach to the district and introduced an educational approach to reaching the whole child, not just the corresponding test scores. While Baltimore City remains a decentralized district, Dr. Santelisis has also introduced increased transparency and opportunities for families and community members to inform district policy. With a new district landscape and a mobilized advocacy base, Arts Every Day, and Julia is here in support, in partnership with then Fine Arts Coordinator Brian Schneckenberger, research the collective impact process for making systems change and applied for a National Endowment for the Arts Collective Impact Grant. In fall 2017, the Baltimore Arts Education Initiative launched with the goal of an engaging a wide range of stakeholders to create a fine arts strategic plan and actionable goals. In May 2018, Dr. Santelisis presented the Complete Arts Plan as part of the Blueprint, the Blueprint for Success, a district-wide initiative to support student wholeness, literacy, and staff leadership. School year 2022 is the first major benchmark of the arts plan with the goals to increase pre-K to five enrollment every year in visual art and music classes, dance and theater units taught within physical education and language arts respectively. Grades six through eight enrolled in one or more arts classes every year with the option for continuous discipline specific instruction. Grades nine through 12 choose from all subjects to complete the art graduation requirement. Students can enroll in one or more arts disciplines each year to specialize and prepare for college career readiness in the arts. The Baltimore City Public Schools Arts Education Strategic Plan, which hereafter will be referred to simply as the Fine Arts Strategic Plan, was implemented in the spring of 2018 with a specific emphasis on increasing city schools students access to the highest quality of music, visual art, theater, dance, and media arts instruction and nurturing the unique gifts of talent and creativity within our students. The strategic plan is inclusive of five-year implementation goal process and accountability plan to ensure all city school students have equitable access to a comprehensive arts education taught by highly qualified teachers. These are teachers identified as teachers who hold a bachelor's degree and a teaching license from their state who demonstrate competence in the subject area they teach. Teachers who meet the state standards, support student wholeness, and prepare students to practice and appreciate fine arts throughout their lives. The creation and implementation of the Fine Arts Strategic Plan recognizes that high quality arts instruction is an, is an essential component of the city school's blueprint for success. Comprehensive arts education is an essential part of a world-class education, a best practice that research has consistently shown results in increased student engagement, empowerment, self-expression, and achievement, improved school climate, and positive parent and community engagement. With my time today, I will be focusing on how we have been implementing the Fine Arts Plan and thoughts around what our next steps will be in relationship to that plan. The Fine Arts Strategic Plan is broken into seven goals. Implement the arts as core subjects in compliance with COMAR for Fine Arts and ensure that all Baltimore City School students, regardless of where they attend school, have the access to high quality in-school arts education to meet state standards. Ensure consistency in arts curriculum, instruction and assessment, alignment with MSDE Fine Arts standards, and support of arts learning pathways from pre-K through grade 12, utilizing district arts instruction in all arts disciplines. Support student learning in and through the arts by integrating the arts across the curriculum. 
ensure access to student experiences, support quality arts through in and out of school partnerships that augment student learning while celebrating student voice, culture, and traditions, establish an administrative structure to initiate, coordinate, and execute system-wide arts initiatives, professional development, and curriculum, ensure adequate and sustainable arts education funding and in, in equitably distributed across the district, and additional funds are available to support arts innovation and partnerships. Lastly, build a sustainable system infrastructure to track, analyze, and disseminate standardized data on arts instruction, programming, and partnerships in order for parents and schools to make informed decisions. These goals and their outcomes are largely supported by community partnerships and the work of a dedicated fine arts teacher leadership team, and I'd like to tabernacle there for about two seconds to say that the work that I do as a fine arts coordinator could not at all be realized without the support, the tremendous support that I receive from our teachers and our partnerships. My work as the coordinator of fine arts here in Baltimore City is highly concentrated in staffing and recruitment in the areas of fine arts disciplines for city schools nurturing existing partnerships and developing new partnerships as the work leads in that direction, improving teacher and school support and increasing meaningful student experiences. In school year 1819, city schools employed, uh oh, In school year 1819, city schools employed 201 fine arts teachers. 108 of those teachers were visual arts teachers, 83 music teachers, four dance teachers, and six theater teachers. We experienced some changes in Comar. Those Comar changes allowed us to be able to increase the fine arts offerings that we have in terms of staff members. Our budget guidance also had to change. So since there were changes that were pulled down from ESSA to Comar, we knew that we had to adapt some changes with how fine arts were offered in Baltimore City Schools. And as a result of that, our budget and guidance changed to schools as well. Now the changes to Comar um, were enacted, I think, in about October of 2017, but that did not provide a comfortable space for us to be able to make those changes in district schools. As for one, we were not at all certain that we would be able to fill any positions that would be created, and then just upsetting the school schedule as it were at that time. So as a result of that, our team got together and crafted a budget guidance that is, um, uh, it's a, a model, it's modeled after what is offered across the state. Um, but it is uh, pretty reasonable in terms of what we will be able to manage in Baltimore City Schools. So what you'll see on the graph is that um, this is different from before. Before, our budget guidance was that all of our schools had to employ at least a 0.5 FTE in the fine arts subject before they were able to employ the uses of vendors or fine arts um, contractors. Now, our budget guidance is by ratio, by student ratio. So according to the student populations in the school building, we have made recommendations for what schools should staff. Schools are not um, allowed to employ the uses of outside vendors and contractors until they have met the staffing requirement. Uh, so in terms of the increases in staff, 
that we are um, anticipating for next school year. It required us to have a pretty robust recruitment strategy. So as we were looking to onboard about 40 vacancies um, for next school year, we definitely had to step up what we were doing in terms of locating uh, eligible candidates for those positions. Um, and what we were able to find out was that for the first time in a long time, Baltimore City was able to be in the running with our other um, districts across the state, which brought forth some other, um, I think, areas of concern. One was that there's a shortage in fine arts teachers across the state. And, and asking some of my colleagues um, in other locales like uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, they're experiencing fine art shortages as well. So that has prompted um, some conversations that we're having with higher ed. Um, those recruiting strategies that we were able to put in place was um, in-person visits to um, our local schools like Towson and MICA, um, partnerships and recruitment, partnerships and, hold on, way too far away, sorry. Participating in recruitment information sharing and networking events at various colleges and universities. We also did, um, uh, this is a digital age, so use of Handshake. And Handshake is an addition of uh, job postings, but it's pretty concentrated just towards um, colleges and universities. So we're able to put the word out about Baltimore City's vacancies to um, college, uh, to applicants who would have already fulfilled a good portion of the requirements that they would need for certification. We were also able to leverage uh, music organizations to help spread the word regarding our vacancies. So this is in terms of Greek organizations like Tau Beta Sigma and Kappa Kappa Psi. So um, we were able to kind of mobilize our uh, alumni from those groups to be able to help us spread the word about our vacancies. And then we've also been able to have a prospective fine arts teacher social event, which is the first of its kind. We were very excited about that. I think we had maybe about 40 or so people that were in attendance of that. And we are still seeing the fruits of that today, as many of those people that attended that information session did apply to city schools. As I mentioned earlier, the work that I do as fine arts coordinator honestly would not be realized without the existence of very strong partnerships that we have. And on the slide that I have available for us today is just a mention of maybe some of our larger organizations, but it in no way represents the, amendous, the tremendous amount of support that we receive from some smaller organizations as well. We have some great developments in fine arts with regard to our fine arts strategic plan supports. We were able to acquire a four-year Baltimore Arts Education Initiative manager's position that was added. Um, that person is a full-time employee of Arts Every Day, but is loaned to me on a part-time basis um, in support of initiatives for the strategic plan. Um, that work is ever developing every day as the needs for uh, that role changes. Right now, Becca Belleville occupies that position and she supports with regard to fine arts um, and impl implementation of activities for BCPS arts education plan. She assists with data collection, data analysis and reporting for the art look map, manages the challenge fund. The challenge fund, you ask, what is that? MeQ, a challenge fund was established um, this year. It was $200,000 grant in support of fine arts materials across the district, it's leveraged over four years, um, and $30,000 has been distributed this year to schools. We have also been able to attain a $100,000 national endowment for the arts implementation grant. The implementation grant will be used to supplement the following fine arts initiatives, professional development, support for new teachers, we're calling that a new ticks. you can use that as you like, curriculum resource support, funding for one year position for arts curriculum resource specialist, boosting theater extensions and wit and wisdom and data visualizations art look map.
in terms of teacher support and professional development. We are hosting conversations to support teachers who are currently working on a conditional te teaching license, professional development opportunities that extend past systemic days. So I don't know if you guys were here for um, the works, if you remember anybody, the works. That was a professional development model that we had in Baltimore City Schools where it allowed teachers the opportunity to do uh, more in-depth study um, uh, around curriculum and ideas. So I have kind of thought about that and swirled that opportunity around again for our teachers to be able to experience that. Research tells us that teachers need at least 15 hours of practice before something becomes a practice for them. So it makes sense that if I was able to, as a coordinator, see that our teachers had deficits, that I'd be able to address those deficits within um, some of the systemic things that we already had in place. The professional development model will focus on three discrete skills per discipline and one skill per cycle. And they tie, those cycles tie to um, systemic district-wide arts events such as For Your Inspiration, which is our district-wide visual arts showcase that happens at the Baltimore Museum of Art every spring. In addition to music assessments that happen in the spring as well, that usually they'll that have been hosted at Morgan State University. New Teacher Institute Extension, also called a NUTIX, uses existing district models to maximize new teacher support by using professional learning communities where the focus is on developing finite teaching skills with, the liberals, with deliverables and metrics in support of new teacher learning and partnerships with local institutions in support of new teacher coaching this is developing conversations with Micah, Morgan, and Coppin. Some of our student experiences and showcases this school year have been on the visual arts side, the MAEA art exhibition. We had a Baltimore Visitor Center Black History Art Exhibition, FYI, For Your Inspiration Art Exhibition, and uh, our First Lady of Maryland. She has hosts one as well. Performing arts exhibitions and showcases have been the Dance Adjudication, Dance Symposium, High School Honor Band, Spring Choral and Band Festival and Assessment, Solo and Ensemble Festival, which is the first one that we've had in almost a decade, and Middle School Honor Band. And also, if I could add, many of, we had, I think, four schools this year that advanced from our local district assessments on to the state, which was double. I'm so happy that you're mentioning that, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> we did. I'm very, and very happy. It makes me happy to mention it also, Commissioner. We had two last year that qualified, so we doubled the number this year. That makes me tremendously happy, hoping we'll be able to do it again next year. In addition to that, for our first time having a solo and ensemble festival and maybe about a decade here in city schools, we were able to send three of our students on to the state level. All of our groups and students that came back, they scored a, a rating of excellent. So that makes me tremendously proud, and I think that that's definitely um, something, worth, something worth celebrating. So thank you guys for allowing me the opportunity to speak on that. Some of our schools that have... Um, Fine Arts Programming Focus, Augusta Fell Savage Institute of Visual Arts, Baltimore Design School, Baltimore for School for the Arts, Booker T. Washington Middle School for the Arts, Connections, a community-based arts school, Margaret T. Brent Elementary School, and Creative City Public Charter School. Our next steps. We are looking to establish our first arts integration cohort establishing certification requirements for media arts instructors in Baltimore City Schools, continuing the recruitment process. We're looking to get out a little bit earlier this year, hopefully in October, which means that the season will not close for us. Implementing professional development plans and ongoing enhancements and revisions to the fine arts curricula. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today. If you have any questions or comments. I'm going on. I know I'm going to look at him, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Fine Arts. I will not hurt you for not mentioning Farm U Alpha as one of those organizations. Oh, no, that you please. I'm sorry. 
Find me alpha good. and find me alpha. Are you really are you really talking with them to yes. support? Okay, good. Mm-hmm. So now I feel better. About yes. That. <laughs> I do want to say that um, I certainly appreciate the work that you do and Ms. Cook that, that you all are doing to um, support the holistic um, development of our young people here in city schools. I also think that it is rather insane for you to be serving in an office practically of one. I appreciate the work that is happening with um, Arts Every Day and the support that they provide, but it's really tough um, to really expand the work of the fine arts um, program with one coordinator that is coordinating everything. No other system, I actually have not heard of another system that does that. You generally have maybe a coordinator and then you have someone that specializes in general instrumental music, the several different genres of music and visual art in theater and in dance. Um, so I know that your job is tough, so I just want to say thank you but at the same time you know in going to the city council uh meeting last night where you know our ceo and board chair gave an overview of the budget process we really have to start advocating to support the holistic development of our young people and yes fine arts instruction is expensive um, but it is necessary and it should not be an extra part to the instructional process for our young people. It should be a co-curricular support that enhances the work um, that we're all you know, trying to, to, to aim towards. So it brings me to the point of a lot of um, operational um, enhancements that you're working on as the coordinator, but in that office where you're practically working by yourself, I didn't hear much about the instructional achievement that is currently happening um, with our students. And it could be because you're looking at recruitment and trying to make sure that we have certified teachers, especially with the expansion of Comar. But we also approved fine arts curriculum last year, K-8. And I wish I would have, well, I know that we'll hear more about it. Um, but I would like to hear more about how the curriculum is doing, how our students are doing, how that curriculum and the rollout of that curriculum is impacting student achievement across the board, how it is enhancing the work of wit and wisdom. And I heard that um, you're supporting that work in the theater uh, aspect, but how else are we using the arts to support the holistic work of, of all of our students achieving throughout the district? It's hard for you to track that when you're the only one pretty much uh, navigating through that. So we really have to figure that out as a district, um, how to support what you're doing and what we're all trying to do to, to support the, the work of young people especially when it comes to careers in the arts, which is why we do want to have certified teachers that are in our classrooms. Um, but we also have to articulate career and college in the fine arts um, as well. That's something that I would like to hear more about, and maybe it will come in CTE or something like that, I'm not sure. But I would like to hear all of this work that we're doing, all of the grants, and that is wonderful because we don't have a grants um, office in the district, but it sounds like fine arts is pretty much leading the way in um, figuring out how to leverage community supports and partnerships so that that can support curriculum. I think that's important. Um, with, uh, I'm glad you mentioned Handshake because that's something new. Uh, so I'm going to look into that. But when we talk about, in slide 15, it talks about next steps. Maybe it's 15? No, 14. 15. Whereas current schools with arts programming focus. Where do our 21st century schools fall in to um, arts programming? I know we have several schools that are like STEAM schools or STEM schools. That can mean several things. Um, so where do our 21st century schools fall in with fine arts programming and, and how is the work going to support the work in those 21st century schools? That's a question that we're working on the answer to. Okay. I would really love to hear that, especially with these new, and here comes Dawn Shirey. She just walked into the room as we're talking about 21st century <laughs> programming. But I'm sure we'll hear about it. But I'm curious to know, because we have all of these fabulous spaces, um, do we have the human resources to um, tend to those needs 
Um, and do we also have the curricular supports that are meeting the needs of the communities where we are now putting these 21st century um, buildings? Commissioner, so, if I may. So in terms of the curriculum supports, one of the things that I'm very proud about, and thank you for bringing that up, um, in your comments today is our curriculum because it's pretty fluid. As we know, equity has been an issue in Baltimore City Schools, so it's kind of hard to say that a fifth grader should be at a particular sure. level when they have not had the access to the arts that they should have that would have been ideal for them to have that. So our curriculum is pretty fluid in that it allows our teachers to jump in where they need to jump in with regard to our students. Um, in addition to our 21st century schools, because many of them, all of them I think are being built um, specifically with kilns mm -hmm. in, in those, um, those spaces, we are making sure that one, our teachers in this professional development cycle that's upcoming in August, all of our teachers are um, going through a kiln safety class where they will be certificated at the end of that That's so that it will allow them the opportunity to be able to use those kilns properly in addition to finding out ways that we can leverage more material um, and, and finances to be able to support that work in those schools. Additionally, the 21st century schools are also being prepared for um, amazing music spaces um, and we are working pretty hard to make sure that we have um, the right people in those spaces to make sure that they're developing programs. And there was one other thing. Um, we are also looking at, and this was in a conversation that I had with um, Chief Conley a few check-ins ago, one of the things that we are really, really proud of is some of the ways that um, our engineers and architects have been thinking as far as the 21st century projection for arts and schools. Patterson comes to mind in particular because they have a, a a really creative way that they're using the, the new auditorium space. So I don't know if you guys know, I think it's kind of sort of like a black box. So that gives the opportunity to for them to create whatever they need to create mm -hmm. within that space. So, you know, in terms of where schools might um, be limited in what they're able to do, having an auditorium that also serves as a black box also enables that school to be able to develop a, a I was even thinking um, media arts or um, theater programs. So, um, we are thinking about, I am thinking about ways that we are able to incorporate those spaces that we have and who the right people would be to fill those spaces. But again, as you've mentioned, it's a little bit tough in the office of one. Oh, it's challenging. And like we really have to, we have to work around that to, for improved student outcomes, right? And we think about human capital and we think about the value that we have on our, we value our staff, but we also don't want our staff to burn out because you're focused on so much, this is heavy work. Um, and so I just wanna say thank you to you, but at the same time, we as a district have to expand that fine arts office so that we get um, Im improved student outcomes. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, do you have any questions? No, no, no. Okay, I'm, I'm, I, after what I've just heard, all I can say is amen, and that we really do need to uh, uh, take heed to the things that uh, Commissioner uh, uh, McFadden has just said, especially around um, looking at the resources and uh, financial resources um, that we need to expand the work that you're doing. And again, thank you so much. And you should smile and, and keep um, celebrating all those good things um, things that have happened for you this year. Thank you so much. Thank you. I do, and I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I do want to also just mention, um, I appreciate seeing on Channel 77 the assessments that play and um, how you have expanded the participation of groups and organizations that are participating in that process. Um, I think it's a very healthy process, especially for all of our districts. So thank you for that. And I look forward to seeing even more schools participate in next year. I do as well. Thank you, sir. Um, our next update re actually is a, a great tie-in to what we were just hearing since we talked about some of the schools that uh, focus on um, fine arts careers. And um, so we're going to have an update on the career technology education. Good afternoon. I'm Stan Wolf with the Career and Technology Education Department. Good afternoon, I'm Rachel Pfeiffer, Executive Director of College and Career Readiness. Oops, thank you, Stan. Um, first, just want to note that um, 
there is a slightly broader report that is going to come to you next week at the board meeting. Um, and so just wanted to cue that up as this, this will kind of preview that. Um, so as we look at our work in helping to prepare students for careers, our CTE programming is a significant portion of that work, um, looking at how we prepare students to graduate from city schools with the skills, uh, the certification and the, the experiences that will allow them to earn a wage that will support a family in not just have a job, but have a career um, that has a trajectory. Um, in the Office of College and Career Readiness, we are focused on students being um, able to be prepared for and, and to pursue well-matched post-secondary options, and we have four key ways that we're doing that. We're talking about developing students' knowledge about um, knowledge and skills related to college and career, connecting students and preparing adults to work with students to help guide them. Um, through the process of college and career, um, high quality work-based learning options for students to pursue so that they can get experiences before they leave us um, to understand what they like and to pursue various interests, and then helping students to develop plans in line with their post-secondary goals. Um, for middle school students, that will look like plans tied to high school choice, which we heard about earlier, and for high school students, it'll be a plan tied to what they're interested in for career. All of our CTE programs of studies, or pathways as they're known, uh, can be lumped into uh, one of 12 career clusters, which are identified by MSDE. And you can see them on the screen now. And they range everything from, uh, from information technology to construction and development uh, to fields like consumer services and hospitality and manufacturing uh, engineering. So as you can see here that um, over the past couple of years, the CTE enrollment has been on the rise, um, while the high school enrollment has been on a slight downturn. So now approximately 51% uh, of all of our high school students are at least enrolled or have been enrolled in a CTE course throughout their career. And the idea of uh, CT enrollee is very important because there are three real designations when we talk about uh, CTE students. Um, and the first one is a CT enrollee. And that is a student who at some point in their career has taken at least one CTE course. Maybe they tried a course and they didn't like it or they were more they were interested in learning about a certain field and enrolled in a course. A CTE concentrator is a student who is enrolled in at least two CTE courses, or has successfully passed two CTE courses, and is now enrolled in a third CTE course in that same pathway. So this is really a student who has dedicated or is almost declared a, a CTE major, if you will. And the final designation is a CTE completer, and that is a student who has uh, completed all of the required CTE courses uh, for a program of study. So, and every year we uh, submit a number of data points to MSDE and they give us back a bit of a report card uh, as for how we're doing. And one of the things they look at is they look at CTE concentrators. So it's important to know that this data that they report to us is looking at students who have already taken at least two CTE courses and are enrolled in a third CTE course. Um, so as you can see, um, many of our uh, data points are up from last year. Um, just as a uh, point of emphasis or clarity, um, the idea of technical skills attainment is considered CTE certifications. So a number of our CTE fields have a certification or industry certification tied to it. Um, and another question that often comes up is the idea of non-traditional enrollment and non-traditional completion. Um, and those are areas which are mostly refer to um, a uh, number of students uh, of a certain gender enrolled in a non-traditional field. So for example, it would be um, female students enrolled in like a construction pathway or male students enrolled in a um, in like cosmetology. So those are uh, those are identifiers that MSD uh, looks at this, to see making sure we are, uh, you know, having a, a decent uh, non-traditional enrollment number. 
So one of our focus areas for this year was to really dig into our CTE data in a different way that we've looked at it before. And so I want to thank Stan for thinking of this particular way of portraying it. The data that Stan just reviewed that MSD typically looks at focuses on concentrators. And essentially that's you know, thinking of a track metaphor like the last 100 of 400 meters. Um, what we wanted to do was to actually look at what is happening with our students from the first moment that they enroll in the CTE course to understand what their trajectory is from, you know, the time they step on the track all the way around. Um, and so as in order to do that, we decided we needed some additional help. So apologies for the typo on this, on this page. We'll get that fixed. But we were able to receive some really generous funding from the ABLE Foundation um, to contract with Education Strategy Group, um, an outside consulting group that does a lot of work within CTE and career and college readiness. And they conducted a comprehensive review of our programs um, to help us think through what we needed to change for the future in order to help our students be competitive. That report is what will come to the board next Tuesday, um, and they will present their findings um, from that report. But we felt it was really important to get um, some external perspective on our programming um, so that we could just really be well informed in doing this work. Um, ESG did... Um, a similar report from Montgomery County that came out reviewing their CT programs. It came out last September, September 2018. Um, we asked them to look at a few key areas. They went in depth looking at how our programs were aligned to the labor market. Um, they looked at the quality and the rigor of our CTE programming. They looked at the equity um, in access to the programs and the equity of outcomes from the programs. They looked at student achievement um, for students in CTE programming, and they looked at the relationships that the employers had, uh, both with the district and opportunities for students um, in employment. Um, so again, that the highlights from that report will come on Tuesday, and we're excited to share those with you. A couple of the current CD partnership highlights that I would like to um, highlight um, are listed on the slide above. Um, so one thing is we have partnered with YMC Head Start, YMCA Head Start, to create a Head Start facility at Edmondson Westside. Uh, so the students who are enrolled in the early childhood education program get a real hands-on experience working with uh, youth at a Head Start setting. And Head Start uh, has actually offered to uh, work with the students beyond graduation to get them uh, to hire them uh, in Head Start and putting through their training program. Um, also at Edmondson Head Edmondson Westside, we also um, UMMC. Uh, has generously uh, donated supplies and labor and resources for a, uh, a nursing simulation lab so that way the students in the in the Academy of Health Professions program um, have up-to-date uh, uh, equipment and state-of-the-art equipment uh, so that way they can uh, practice their, their crafts. Um, just this past year uh, BGE uh, was uh, awarded um, was recognized uh, for their great partnership with Baltimore City Schools by MSDE. Uh, so there's an award ceremony, uh, I think it was in April, um, in which BG was rec BGE and City Schools is recognized for having a tremendous partnership. BGE does a great job with internships and, and supporting students uh, in our various pathways. And we had a very successful uh, high school senior uh, career fair this past year. We, we partnered with MOED uh, and had a, there was close to 100 employers there um, and many high school seniors were able to come there and um, uh, interview with employers. Some actually got hired on the spot. So it was a really uh, outstanding opportunity. Um, we've had numerous pop-up restaurants with our culinary students at our house. Um, you've probably seen flyers throughout the year. Um, those have become quite frequent. Um, uh, also this year, we have a really great partnership with J.P. Morgan Chase and the Talent Ready Group, uh, which is a, a really exciting opportunity for uh, Baltimore City to partner with other jurisdictions in Central Maryland uh, and Northern Virginia to really expand uh, computer science and IT fields and exposure to students in those fields. Um, just because there, there are a number of jobs, uh, careers in those areas uh, to really get more students into that pipeline. 
And finally, we uh, also have a great partnership with uh, Grads to Careers, which is a post-high school uh, training program that helps students uh, continue training and education and helps place them in jobs. Um, so increasing access uh, in CTE programs, a couple of things we're, we're doing next year is we are actually adding three new CTE construction programs. Um, we're adding the district's first HVAC program at REACH. Um, we will be adding an electrical program at Carver and uh, adding those district's first plumbing program at Mervo. And those are very high need, uh, high wage careers. Um, the other thing we're looking at is a, it's a new program called Apprenticeship Maryland, um, and it's a program in which students uh, in high school uh, can start a pre-apprenticeship while they're in high school. And, and it actually, um, the interesting part about this is they don't actually receive the instruction at their school. They receive that with uh, an industry professional. So students will literally leave high school for part of a day or over the summer or weekends to be trained by uh, industry. Um, as I mentioned before, we're extending or expanding our IT programs as it is a high need uh, path pathway. Um, and we're also looking at really uh, uh, increasing exposure for students and parents to what CTE, CTE is. Um, traditionally, CTE programs have been thought as programs for students who aren't going to college, but that's really changing as a way of these are now pre-college and pre-career programs. And many of our CTE programs actually also um, lead to articulated college credits. And also, uh, one of the other major pushes this year is expansion, uh, ext increasing rigor. Um, so we want to extend dual credit opportunities for our students, um, create more articulated college credits uh, for, our for our students who want to go the community college route, um, and also realign some of our pathways um, to ensure that they're meeting the labor market demands. One of the things that we are aware of um, as we, you know, spoke with teachers and students this year is that there's um, great opportunity to continue to help our CTE teachers collaborate with each other um, and to collaborate with other teachers in the building. Um, we have spent a lot of this year helping um, with a CTE teacher lead in each area who then works with fellow teachers to think through what skills students need to have um, when they graduate and to back map, back map uh, their curriculum uh, accordingly. Um, and we really want to just continue to invest in our teachers. The uh, CTE teachers are unique in schools because many of them spent many years in industry um, doing whatever their particular career field was and then decided to come and teach students that area. And so we want to make sure that we're continuing to support them with the teacher certifications that they need, with professional learning communities. This year we did, had a particular special learning community for CTE teachers who were new teachers. Um, and to really think through how we can continue to make connections with core content uh, teachers as well because we know that um, CTE teachers should be collaborating with um, the math, English, science, social studies, arts teachers at their schools as well. Um, we also are looking in the next uh, several years to centralize the coordination of work-based learning. Um, in the past, schools had work-based learning coordinators, and while we would love to get back to that, we recognize that it can be difficult to ask um, a school to do that on top of other things that we have. So we're looking at what infrastructure we can put in place as a district to be able to help match students to internship opportunities. Um, one of our particular ideas is the development of a database that would allow us to vet employers coming in and see what they want to offer and make sure that it's a right fit for our students and then help provide schools with more information about those employment opportunities so students or, or their teachers or counselors can see that information and help match students to those opportunities. Um, tied to that, I mentioned earlier is one of our core um, CCR goals that we are working on individualized student plans. And so 
You know, we want to tie it to students' career goals, not to lock them in, but to help them develop a plan that will help them reach their goals. And those goals may change, and then we can help change the plan accordingly. But we would like to be able to ask students what they're interested in, what they'd like to do as a career, and then help them plan toward that by providing mentoring opportunities for them, providing the work-based learning, as we mentioned before, and then making sure that we can equip our school counselors and CTE teachers with the knowledge of all the different opportunities that are out there for students to pursue when they graduate and even during the school year. So um, before we talk about some of our partnership developments, uh, one of the next steps we're looking at doing is realigning our industry advisory groups to focus on work-based learning. We know that many of our, our partners uh, throughout the city have uh, opportunities for our students. We really want to galvanize uh, and, and, and collectively work together to identify what those are. Um, and that includes uh, industry and local philanthropy groups as well. Um, and the final piece we're looking at doing is developing a youth leadership advisory group for college and career readiness. So really to talk to students about what their interests are, what their interests are, and maybe what, some, what are some of the barriers they, uh, uh, they're having in reaching their goals. Thank you. Uh, I forget that there are extra things in the, in the, the, the appendix. Sorry about that. Um, Commissioner? Thank you. Um, I have a lot to say, and what I'd like to say is that I think this is an excellent report for somebody, someone coming from higher ed mm -hmm. and, you know, moving over to K through 12. Um, no, one of the most important things that we want our students in K through 12 or higher, uh, high school going into college is to have a uh, second career. Mm -hmm. And what is most important that I noticed, and I was going to ask a question until I, you moved down further, is putting together a uh, program or uh, a program such as, I don't know if you're familiar with a DACOM com committee, where you bring in all of the um, people who are involved in each of the programs, industry, mm -hmm. uh, employers, where we all get together and talk about, for example, construction, mm -hmm. where all the con contractors, construction um, employers come together and talk about what they expect from our students. Mm -hmm. What is most important that I heard in many of these committees and um, programs is that we want them to come to us knowing exactly what to do. And yeah. internship is critical. One of the things that they've always complained about is that we train our students in certain curriculum, a program, nursing, um, construction, um, whatever, phlebotomy, whatever. And then when they get on the job, they spend additional time mm -hmm. retraining them. And um, it costs them a lot of money. And that's really what slows them down to hiring the students. Mm -hmm. So but, um, what I notice is that you've already done that. You've done that. You bring your students in for internship. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And um, in addition to that, I think that all students, even though they haven't thought about going to college or they don't want to go to college, I think that I always would encourage students to take up a, um, a skill, a program, because even in your route to wherever you're going after graduation, you can always work mm -hmm. and you can always go to college. And I find that even if your goals are for a four-year co college degree, you can always have a um, something to fall back on. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really happy, and I don't know if you know that at Renaissance, they just, I was really happy, they had nine students who took the phlebotomy mm -hmm. course. Eight of the students completed it. They are now doing their clinical. And I was really happy about that because uh, eight out of nine is a whole lot. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal. So um, looking at all the curriculums, all the programs, I think that you're doing an outstanding job. This is the meat of everything. When we, our students graduate, we want to see them move on to, to some type of position where they can work. You know, so um, I think this is a good idea to continue doing the good work that you're doing in this, in this program. Thank you. CTE. And I would just add that we really, we every pathway has a, an advisory group of employers, um, but we really are just getting, um, 
we're just going back to them to do that mapping that you mentioned in terms of what skills um, they're looking for. So it's been done in the past, but the skills change. So we're in the process of going back to, to update that. And that's important what you just said because the skills change. Mm -hmm. And um, we have to also work with our teachers mm -hmm. to make sure that they're on board right. because what they're doing, have been doing for years Things change daily, minute by minute. You know that. So I think that it's good to put together a DACOM for each curriculum, mm -hmm. for each program, regardless of what it is. If it's cosmetology, you put together one for all the cosmetologists where they can tell the students and talk with them and tell what they expect when they hire them on the job. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, um, I'm really excited about the development of the youth uh, leadership advisory group. I think it will give um, really, really good feedback to inform the work that you all are doing. So I'm eager to hear about how that is developed and rolled out over time. I think it's a brilliant idea, uh, Dr. Pfeiffer. It is doctor, right? It is doctor. It is doctor. Good. Um, I want to know how we are, I know it is a lot of work for school counselors um, and school staff to kind of track these four-year plans, mm -hmm. but can you talk to me a little bit about that, tracking that, that four-year plan, and also how students are admitted into the CTE program, mm -hmm. so do they apply, is there an interview where we're talking about their interests initially, mm -hmm. and then do, do we use that to place them and then track them? Um, can you just talk a little bit more about that? Sure, I'll talk about the four-year plans and then I'll pass it sure. over to Stan. So the four-year plans are a work in progress. Um, it's actually a regular weekly meeting with my team right now to figure out the implementation and that's also a place where we're meeting with students and we're meeting with schools and we're actually trying to pilot in a couple schools over these last few weeks of school just to get additional information before we go into the summer. So I'm going to say I'll have to come back to you with the details of how we're going to, to keep it in, um, to keep track of them, but we are trying to figure that out. So I should say that, so many of our CTE programs uh, don't start until the 10th grade. Um, so because of that, what happens most of the time, so as school counselors or school staff at the high schools go out and talk to the middle schools, many times they'll bring CTE teachers or CTE students with them to talk to seventh and eighth graders about the various programs at the schools. Um, and then many, uh, during the choice fair, the CTE programs are heavily highlighted. There's even a little CTE exhibition area. Um, CTE is, is, uh, has a dedicated space in the choice guide as well. Um, and, many of the op and many schools have open houses where they highlight the CTE programs. Um, so then once a student makes a decision and goes to a high school, once they're in ninth grade, um, many of our high schools will have um, shadow days where ninth graders may shadow um, a, a tenth or eleventh grader to kind of get a taste of what it's like to be a carpentry student or what it's like to be in a culinary student. Um, many times the, uh, the students will have a different exposures to the various teachers as well. So they'll get a chance to get a taste, maybe on like a two or three week rotation with many of the different CTE teachers to find out the different career paths. Um, so then normally by the, um, in the spring of their freshman year, uh, many of our schools have what they call like a CTE decision day where they will sort of decide which CTE path they want to go into. That's helpful. With that, I want to know um, eventually how we are um, articulating CTE programming at the middle school level, mm -hmm. particularly, for example, at a school like Mervo, mm -hmm. and we're just talking about seats and enrollment and choice at schools mm -hmm. like the Stadium School. Yeah. Are we focusing um, on schools that are in that close uh, of proximity to our strong schools like like Mervo or Carver, or I mean, schools that have robust CTE programs? I'm curious to know more about that. Um, over time as we're trying to increase um, enrollment, you know, across the board, but to also better articulate high school choice options to middle schools that are right in the area of some of our stronger CTU, CTE schools. That's just something um, that I, that I want to flag. And then finally, um, the, how do we partner with the Office of Employment Development with the city? Um, and are there 
um, ways that students transition directly into jobs once they graduate. I would be really interested to know about that. Um, and with Commissioner Bondima being here, how are we partner, partnering with community colleges um, and trade schools um, to kind of con to, to build um, a stronger continuum from what we finish in city schools and how we continue and ensure that our young people are in um, jobs where they can thrive and have healthy lives. I'm curious to know about that. So let me start with the second question first, if I could. So yeah, as part of uh, the industry relationships we build, uh, and most of it really is the teachers who do a great job because most of it, like, like Dr. Fiverr said, have come from industry and already have a good relationship with industry partners. So one of the things that our program advisory committees do is they come in um, and they sort of set up these work-based learning opportunities. So it's not uncommon to have various uh, number of employers come in and talk to students in the programs. Uh, many of our, our schools have field trips to the different training programs. Um, you know, maybe even internships over the summer. Sometimes they'll hire students for youth work opportunities because um, it's really important that um, our students, especially during their you know their junior and senior year, have really built up a network of um, of employers. So that way, we want to make sure that whenever they're walking across the stage and getting that diploma, that they don't know what's next, right? So we want to make sure that throughout their senior year, we're really putting them in front of as many employers, building those partnerships. Um, as we can, and we do that, like I said, through field trips, through job shadow days, through mentorships, um, all those sorts of activities. I think. Did I answer your question? Sorry. Dr. Pfeiffer was going to add some. Um, just in in relation to our working with the uh, uh, Mayor's Office of Employment mm -hmm. Development, we we work very closely with them. I think we're probably in touch weekly in some form or fashion. Um, I serve um, as the co-chair of of the Workforce Development Board's Youth Committee, um, and which is staffed by um, MOED and gives us the okay. opportunity to think really closely about what strategies we put in place kind of citywide. And as you may know, um, that office is working on developing a coordinated workforce system and, you know, where there would kind of be a single point of entry for people to get all access to various supports that they would need to get jobs. And so part of our work is to help think through what it needs to look like for young people. Um, the Grads to Careers program that Stan mentioned that also is helping to connect students with workforce training programs is jointly run between um, city schools and MOED. And the other thing I, I forgot to mention is that, so one of the things we also did this year is during all of our uh, citywide professional development opportunities when the CT teachers all came together, we normally dedicate the first 45 minutes or an hour to have industry professionals come in and talk about the opportunities they have right now for the CTE students, right? Because the teachers are kind of really where the rubber meets the road, right? So we give teachers the opportunity to interact with the various employers, the community colleges, the trade schools, to kind of find out what they're about. And what they do is then they'll set up opportunities for them to come in and talk to their students. And we've also done the same with the, the counseling staff as well. I would love to also see uh, how we are um, leveraging the Youth Works program to perhaps extend what is happening in our CTE programs to give our young people um, some more on the job experience that they get paid for um, and it will ultimately strengthen our CTE programs. That's right. um, so I would love to just hear that conversation continue, mm -hmm. but especially as we're going into the summer, how are our young people that are in these strong CTE programs to show promise continuing throughout the summer um, in programs like YouthWorks, mm -hmm. in addition to all the other partnerships that you've talked about. Yeah. Um, but with YouthWorks being a big one, I think that um, is important. And then finally, I just want to say I'm so happy that the REACH is moving out of that Lake Clifton building <laughs> um, because of the CTE programming that they have there, but it's kind of limited um, because of um, how bad that building is so i'm just glad to see them transitioning hopefully very soon um and how that ct program can those programs can continue to thrive because they got some good things happening in that school absolutely thank you i just have one question and, and it's it really is around um some of what you talked about in increasing access to programs and that's that's uh, the k to eight level um within the strategy other than just the marketing i mean are there any are there any plans around explorations and experiences that students will have k-8 that would 
more than just talking about what a program is, but, but some, some type of experience to learn about it better. So that is um, the conversation that we're in the midst of now. So we don't have plans around it yet, but um, there are certainly some experiences um, with robotics and with our project Lead the Way um, in a number of schools that, well, in a few schools that we would like to try to expand to more students. Um, and we are just discussing kind of you know, the funding and, and the best way to approach um, rolling that out. Yeah. And, 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 you know, with that, then sort of the connection for them to see that mm -hmm. that lead, yeah. could lead to a particular path and making some choices. I think that's one of the areas within that choice process that's very, it's wonderful to go and see the, the school and, you know, the, the exhibit, mm -hmm. but students don't really understand in many cases what that means. Right. And so the, the sooner or the earlier they can have those kinds of experiences, I think the better. Agreed. Think okay. We have a good opportunity to kind of do that in some of our 21st century buildings. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah. Don, 21st century buildings, going to do a lot. That's right. And I feel like Don would want me to share. We're talking about that with Pimlico right now. As well. All right. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we are ready for procurement. Am I correct? No, we did that first. We changed, yes, sorry. We changed the, uh, the agenda slightly. Um, and at, before we start, just a reminder again that there is a written update um, that's available uh, um, online. Uh, that's the update around the 21st century learning. Okay, so. Uh, Good afternoon. I'm Joe Vogel, the Interim Director of Procurement. There are um, 15 items on the agenda tonight. <clears throat> okay. 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 We have 15. Okay. Okay. All right. right. The, first, <clears throat> the first request the board's approval of a competitively bid requirements contract to provide both short-term and long-term special education certified substitutes for city schools. The estimated annual amount is $1.3 million. The contract term is July 1st of 2019 through June 30th of 2022 with one two-year renewal option. <clears throat> I just have a quick question for Dr. Brooks. Dr. Brooks, do we have, if, if you could explain whether or not um, we're using these vendors to staff us or if we have a pool already um, of folks that we pull from. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So these are for long-term and short-term substitutes that are certified in special education for our citywide programs, as well as for our separate public day schools. So this is for when uh, staff goes out for, if they go out on long-term, let's say um, if a special educator is pregnant and goes out on maternity leave, and so we have to have a long-term sub that's certified in special education. Uh, if there's a vacancy in one of our separate public day schools like Bayer, uh, McMeckin, uh, Lois T. Murray, where they're specialized for the type of students that they're servicing for our citywide programs, such as maybe our ED Pride program or our PAL program that's working with students that are on the spectrum. Uh, these, are the, these are the contractors that we use to be able to provide those direct special education services. So it's not for, let's say, if I'm a principal of a school and one of my special educators is out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other? So I think we're uh, we're fine with that one. We'll move on. All right. The next item requests the board's approval to contract with Crisis Prevention Institute for a total cost of one hundred fourteen thousand one hundred forty dollars to provide trauma sensitive, person centered, nonviolent crisis intervention training focused on prevention and de escalation techniques. Contract period is July first of twenty nineteen through June thirtieth of twenty twenty. Now, Dr. Brooks, this is only for 10, 10 folks? So this is so that 10 additional staff can become trained the trainers. So then we get actually I certified see. to that. Thank you. You're welcome. And I believe earlier during the year, you mentioned how you have also done some training for other, other staff within the system. 
So we have, so we've approximately trained over 400 staff so far. So we want to be able to train more staff. So we need to have more staff that are actually certified so that we can train other staff. Good. The next item request the board's <coughs> approval to renew 13 providers of supplemental <coughs> instructional materials. The estimated annual increase is, uh, excuse me, the estimated annual amount is 200, Two million six thousand dollars. The contract term is July one of twenty nineteen through June thirtieth of twenty twenty two. I just uh, there in the description, it says that some are providing evidence, ESSA evidence, and then some materials are not covered under ESSA evidence standards. Um, so if can, I just need that explained to me, so if if. The materials are not covered under ESSA standards. It's how how we evaluated the effectiveness the effectiveness of the programming? Sure. Um, so some of these materials are um, so Achieve 3000, for example, is a literacy intervention. So that fits very neatly in the box of what the um, ESSA evidence levels are designed to um, evaluate. Um, some of these materials are a little bit trickier than that. So for example, um, Aquaphoenix Scientific, we partner with them. They create kits that align to our elementary science curriculum. So the curriculum is the district curriculum that we created in collaboration with Johns Hopkins. Um, but the actual materials are the materials that the teacher needs to use with the students so the students can actually do the science. The kit in and of themselves, ag agnostic of our curriculum, is really just a bin of stuff. Um, so that you know, bin of stuff um, has not formally been evaluated for its effectiveness. Um, in the future, it's possible that it could be in as basically the city school's curriculum would be the thing that would actually be formally evaluated for effectiveness. And these are the materials that are required to implement that curriculum. Does that make sense? It does. Um, and just uh, to be a little bit more transparent, I think the, we're in the very early stages as an organization of digging through the, the implications of the new ESSA requirements and, and how they impact us. So I think this is the first supplemental materials board letter we've brought to you since we've been doing this as a district. So we're still kind of working through the best way to communicate about that um, when it comes to materials. But for some of the materials on this list, um, they just it, having them evaluated through ESSA wouldn't necessarily make sense, but then for some materials, they maybe haven't been, been evaluated yet, but they should be, and we're working with those vendors to request that evidence, and until we have that evidence, schools may not be able to use certain fund sources to purchase them. Makes sense. Thank you. And all of these would be the, uh, uh, from the various school funds in terms of purchasing these materials, correct? For the most part, there can be some district funding, um, but there isn't any specifically earmarked for any of the items here right now. Sometimes if we get um, additional funding flexibility, we underspend on something and have some money, we may purchase some materials for schools. But right now, there isn't a current plan to do that with any of these. Okay. I think if we aren't asking questions, we're, we're, we're okay. good to go. Okay. <laughs> The next item requests the board's approval to exercise the second and final one-year renewal option with Achievement Network. The estimated one-year contract renewal amount is approximately $1.4 million. Contract term is July 1 of 2019 through June 30 of 2020. The contract includes the purchase of assessments and tools for math, grades 1 through 11. We're fine. Okay. We've read it. Next item request the board's approval of a competitively bid requirements contract to provide school psychology services for students with documented clinical needs for assessment and our services. The estimated annual amount is $1 million. Contract term is July 1 of 2019 <clears throat> through June 30th of 2022 with one two-year renewal option. <clears throat> Next item, request the board's approval of a competitively bid requirements contract which provides social work, counseling services for designated city school students with documented clinical needs for assessment or and or services. 
The estimated annual amount is approximately $715,000. <clears> contract term is July 1 of 2019 through June 30th of 2022, and it includes one two-year renewal option. Although we're not asking questions, I'm just going to say just uh, for the public that th these are uh, for students who are receiving um, special education services. So, yeah. The next item requests the board's approval of a requirements contract with TechTerra Education LLC to provide <clears throat> materials for STEM technology, instructional training and delivery, as well as professional development services. Contract term is June 12th of 2019 through June 11th of 2022. The estimated contract amount is $409,000. <clears throat> The next item requests board's approval for tuition reimbursement for Towson University's master degree transformative leadership for edu excellence and equ equity <clears throat> for city schools employees. The estimated contract amount is $270,000. Contract term is August 20th of 2019 <clears throat> through December 31st of 2023. Madam Chair. So my, my question with this, um, is this the so this is the most cost efficient um, <coughs> partnership that that we've considered for this type of um, teacher leader development program. Yeah. It's the most cost e what? efficient and. Uh, I guess aligned to our our leadership framework, those types of things, in comparison to the other universities that we have within our district. Yeah. Commissioner McFadden, the first thing I would share is that this is really uh, just a, a method to provide direct billing. So the the amount provided to Towson University through this is just the same amount that they normally would receive through uh, normal participants in their programs who our employees would normally receive through tuition reimbursement. Um, so it is actually just paying directly to Towson University instead of the employees having to pay the cost up front and then later be reimbursed. Um, I think Roxanne can share more about um, why this particular partnership now with Towson University, but in terms of the cost, it's actually um, what we already, through our contracts, would pay to employees for tuition reimbursement. Is that explicit within the, would that, would we see that in the procurement item? But it, it's not explicit like the way you just explained it. So is that supposed to be explicit in this procurement request or no? We can make it more explicit. Um, so the, I mean, the line item that it's coming from certainly indicates tuition reimbursement. But if you did not gather that from this, we can we can make it more clear before the Thanks. before the board meeting. Thank you. I don't. I didn't have questions. So. <clears throat> okay. The next item: request board's approval of requirements contract with BKL and Associates to provide consulting services and technical assistance with regard to providing new principals with onboarding, professional development, <clears throat> and coaching. The contract period is July 1st of 2019 through June 30th of 2020. The estimated contract amount is $206,000. <clears throat> the next item requests board's approval of a competitively solicited requirements contract with Power School Group LLC to purchase user licenses for teachers to have access to Power Schools teacher observation learning platform, providing high quality observation feedback and video assessments of instructional practice for calibration purposes. The estimated total is $668,000. <clears> contract term is June 12th of 2019 through June 30th of 2020, and it includes two two year renewal options. It is uh, my, qu my question I have, is this a new um, resource that here or has this been used previously? I'm sorry. This is, this is new. So we have 
um, in past years provided support to individuals who serve as observers using the instructional framework mm -hmm. um, for teachers mm -hmm. uh, to um, both to train them when they initially move into an administrative role or a role where they serve as a qualified observer. Mm -hmm. um, and the intent here is to provide more resources so that people serving as qualified observers have ongoing um, support, both to stay normed and and be and maintain their effectiveness as an as a qualified observer. And I'll let let Jesse share more. Uh, yep. Um, similar to what Jeremy was sharing, um, what we've done thus far has been in person. Um, this would allow us through the platform to be able to have more resources, more training available for uh, school leaders and other uh, qualified observers across the district. Um, and we can modify what that experience is like um, based on this calibration uh, platform. Okay. I would just add that the purpose of the, the <clears throat> initial cost would then uh, renewal options mm -hmm. is that we want to begin um, with uh, principals who are you know serving uh, most directly in in the role and where we believe it is most important knowing that um, this would give us the opportunity to as, as um, we have the funds in the next several years to expand so that mm -hmm. other qualified observers mm -hmm. or even other um, teachers who may provide support to teachers as mentors or in other capacities could also go through this kind of um, okay. support. So the user license would be the individual persons who are actually going through the process. Okay. Yep, yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay, the next item requests the board's approval to contract with new leaders, total cost of $300,000, to continue to provide a preparatory professional development program to school principals in the district. Contract term is July 1 of 2019 <clears throat> through June 30th of 2020. With that, can we go back to BKL and Associates and the, the effectiveness of um, that particular procurement item in comparison to new leaders? Um, and does new leaders, because of what we see here in this procurement item with new leaders um, and the amount of um, rigor that that, we're, that we see here and what is listed. Um, there's no program with new leaders that could support the work that the BKL and Associates um, is able to do um, with the proven. And then you all have listed all of the leaders, well, several leaders within the district that um, have done that, gone through that training, and then BKL and Associates. Um, what's the effectiveness of BKL and Associates? And, and why should we, um, I guess, grant that procurement item or request versus new leaders? Good, good afternoon. With BKL, if you look at the end there, you can see that the number of principals that they are working with, the first year principals this year, are all slated to be returning next year as part of the coaching and the onboarding that they have received. So uh, also it indicates that um, the second year principals, it's at a 93% return rate in order to provide the support that our first and second year principals need as far as coaching, mentoring, and those thought partners. In addition, part of the contract also includes coaching sessions that we are doing with our transformational principles in order to build out a sustainability plan so that we are working to really take our top principles and make sure that they're ready to coach new principles and provide support as well. So that isn't something that is offered through new leaders? New leaders, their contract uh, actually is more of the pipeline work so these are folks that they are training and getting ready to come through the assessment center and then be placed in schools as principals, whereas BKL does the coaching and support for first and second year principals who are already placed. So theirs is not a pipeline avenue, but a coaching and development for already placed The leaders doesn't do any coaching development with current principals? Uh, they started 
less than a year ago of providing year one coaching for new leaders, first year principals. So if the, a principal is placed for that first year, they do provide coaching for them. Thanks. You're welcome. Request the board's approval. Excuse me. The next item requests the board's approval of the contract with Urban Teacher Center as an alternative teacher certification program to recruit, select, train, coach, and support a cohort of resident teachers. The estimated annual amount is $2.5 million. Contract term is July 1 of 2019 <clears throat> through June 30th of 2020. The next item requests the board's approval to contract with Teach for America to train new core <coughs> members, provide professional development for first and second year core members, and recruit and select <coughs> core members for the next three school years. The estimated annual amount is $880,000. <coughs> contract term is July 1 of 2019 through June 30th of 2022. The question I have is not it's not specifically to the con the contract you have here, but I guess I it 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 is in relation to work that we're doing around the recruitment of um, of black teachers. And I just want to know: is there any is there any discussion uh, with these two contracts in terms of connecting some of that work in 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 intentionally looking at candidates? Um, Sure, I would share a couple American of things. Uh, one is that uh, that that working group first came together, um, driven in part by the history in the district. That between 2003 and 2010, the percentage of our teachers who identified as Black or African American went down significantly, and then since 2010, it, it steadied and has increased some. And uh, when we look underneath the data, one of the things that actually helped steady and then slightly increase is that each of our alternative certification programs increased the diversity of their incoming cohorts, um, and in particular, increased the number of black uh, teachers okay. that they were bringing to the district. Um, I, I say that just to say that over time, those programs have had have each had a focus of their own in doing better. Mm -hmm. um, and the the second thing I share is uh, each of these programs actually has been very um, closely involved in our Black Teacher Recruitment and Retention Working Group. So Sherelle James, the local director for Urban Teachers, um, was a member of our core team. Um, uh, a couple people um, who are on staff with Teach for America have been participants in our regular monthly meetings. Um, and our, you don't see uh, the Baltimore City Teaching Residency here, um, but we will be bringing forward a, a request for the Baltimore City Teaching Residency as well. Um, and a couple of their um, uh, leaders actually were leading, helping to lead one of the task forces that that okay. working group put together. Good. Thank you. The next item requests the board's <coughs> approval for two contracts. The first contract is with the mayor's office of employment development to continue a credit recovery program for ninth and tenth graders at the Youth Opportunity Academy. It includes a comprehensive youth development model for overaged and under <coughs> credited students who need a supportive program to assist them in meeting graduation requirements. <coughs> Contract period is July 1st of 2019 through June 30th of 2020. The program costs is approximately $206,000. <clears> the second contract is with the mayor <clears throat> and city council of Baltimore to lease the 7,200 square feet foot space of the school. The cost is $1 per year for the use of the building. <clears throat> yeah. The last item requests the board's <laughs> approval to amend the current community schools contract the additional cost is $134,000 and is to accurately reflect and identify the current partners and actual costs. The board approved the initial contracts on November 13th of 2018. <coughs> Contract term is July 1 of 2018 <coughs> through June 30th of 2019. <coughs> okay. 
has the amount to I'm sorry. Okay, I see what you're doing. Okay, so you have the actual, okay, I see. And in most of these, I'm looking at decreases. Okay. Correct. There, there are some decreases and, and some increases. And a increases. few increases, <clears throat> okay. Basically, we're trying to square out what we really now know. <clears throat> So as we understand and before, there are some decreases just based on additional funding that partners are able to leverage to support their strategy in schools. In the spaces where there are increases, there were instances where changes would happen at the school level or additional resources being able to funnel into the school based on the strategy. So in those instances, it's a similar occurrence. Um, yep. It's just in reverse. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Did we get through it? Thanks. Yes, I did. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> allergies killing me. I understand that. Okay. No problem. Okay. I do think we have... Uh, let me go down. Now, where, where will I find it on? Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing it, but just tell me the name and I'll call. Okay, uh, we do have a uh, public comment. We have uh, Keisha Goodwin who signed up. Sorry. Good afternoon, commissioners, chairs. Um, interesting choice presentation. Um, I was a part of the meetings last year that they had at Douglas High School with uh, James Torrance, and the second one was also with James and uh, Mr. Bevins. The community provided feedback last year, and it was a lot around composite scores and the negative impact of weighted grades on the majority of our students who are average students with other gifts and talents. Um, we also said that we would like for students to really be placed in their area of interest. That would keep students engaged and um, increase our graduation rates as well. With the career technology presentation, I appreciate it. Um, I have questions about are students learning how to design computers, fix computers, and if so, are there uh, coding labs um, in our high schools as well? My piece as a community um, educational representative. I visited Vanguard and I visited Fairleigh not too long ago and realized that these schools do not have a librarian. They have actually, uh, the librarians have been replaced with students having library cards. I don't understand how that equates to the education that a student will receive from a certified teacher who is a librarian that helps students with their research projects. Um, librarians also support schools with uh, media arts and technology. Um, they partner with staff to collaborate with literacy, design and implement um, literacy programs throughout the school. So I'm just trying to figure out how a card replaces a librarian. My last minute, I've been reading the guide, well actually I use this, the Adventure Awaits Guide for Pre-K and Kindergarten. And um, there should really be one letter a week, uh, one sight word a week for our pre kers And our sight words should be the initial sound. So I'm trying to figure out if you learn that the O sound is ah and O, oh, how you get a sight word like two, T-O. That is not the sound that they learn 
and pre-K. So they cannot blend that to sound out the word. Now, yes, some words they should just remember, maybe later in kindergarten and first grade. But if we want our students to really learn how to read, they should be learning sight words or spelling words that go along with what they have learned in class, the sounds, part of their phonics. Okay. I would just say that, you know, um, just as you mentioned, there are the two parts to it. So, yes, mm -hmm. there are some words that with your phonics you can blend, but the idea of sight words are really words that generally don't fit into those patterns, and mm -hmm. you just memorize them. So, yeah, the, the, it can be difficult when you're younger, but right. um, but – that's the difference, but yeah. Um, I, the couple, I will, I will um, and we'll put a request just to check on um, uh, the media specialist in terms of um, just uh, get some answers for you in terms of, you know, where they are and um, the placement of them and, and the criteria. So we'll try to get some information for you to follow up. Thank you. Okay. And those are the two schools that I know of in particularly because I work with those schools, yeah. but there are a lot of I think of other there are schools. others. And those are some of the options and choices that schools have to make for staffing, unfortunately, um, uh, given our, our state of funding right now. But we will, we will find out where they are and, and uh, get some more information for you. And then how we, how we deal with uh, the kinds of things that students should be learning if you don't, in fact, have the actual uh, media specialist there. Thank you. Thank you. I think, yes. Thank you. I thought you could sign up outside as you do for standard board meetings, so my apologies. Um, I wanted to come to talk about the choice. Do, do me a favor just for our, our taping, just make sure we get your name. Yeah. I, yes, okay. ma'am. Um, I wanted to come talk about the choice process. So first, a question to the both of you. Are you familiar with the data, the demographic data, on which students are accruing to advanced academics and ingenuity? If you are not, I would strongly urge you to take a look at them. I receive them via MPI request for which I paid $285, and they are pretty appalling. Second, as the parent of a rising sixth grader who just lived through the choice process, um, I do not have many good things to say about it. And I'm sorry that that is the way that it is presented, but if you are a parent like me, of a child who scored better than 355 on a composite score and also has an IEP and is twice exceptional, here is the process. You can apply to schools, you can apply to charter schools, and you can apply to Ingenuity. Guess what? Those are three separate application processes with three separate deadlines that require three separate forms. You will have to make a decision about whether to not or not to enroll your child in a charter school prior to finding out if they have been accepted to advanced academics and or ingenuity, because the deadlines don't match up. Unlike DC, we do not have a common application form. You will have to chase all this information down. Second, if your child has physical limitations like mine does, you win the great prize of having to go visit all of these schools in person so that you can see the layout and stairs and working condition of the elevator and condition of the athletic fields. In addition, you will have to map the bus route that your 11-year-old will have to take to school because the choice guide does not include the bus route nearest to the school. For ingenuity programs, of the four choices that are about to come online this fall, two are served by high-frequency bus routes and two are not. Of the five advanced academic sites that are already online in, in the city, three are served by high-frequency bus routes and two are not. That means that some children will be waiting upwards of 35 minutes to 60 minutes to board a bus to take them to school. These create significant disparities. I would urge you to look at the transportation work group report. Now, I'm married and my husband and I both have paid time off and flex time. We were able to, between the two of us, divide up phone calls and visits for IEP teams to the schools that our daughter was most interested in. And we were able to get documentation from her care team at Kennedy Krieger. Finally, with the last 30 seconds, this is a high stakes process that we impose on children who are nine and 10 because that is the year, the fourth grade year, that is critical. My daughter suffered a stroke May of 2017 and returned to school nine weeks after being released from the PICU at Johns Hopkins, having to use the other hand to write. She lost her dominant hand that she had had since kindergarten. Now, stroke is really, really uncommon. 
But there are children in this city who every day in fourth grade with Park are facing parental incarceration, eviction, loss of their home, they're hungry, and you're telling them that one quarter of their score is based on those high stakes testing for which they cannot recover. And finally, I would note that the communication from this building regarding some of questions has been exceptionally poor. I had to send four emails and show up to uh, Penn North to Shake and Bake to get a question about whether or not excused absence is counted in the composite score. All I wanted to know is if on the advice of medical counsel and care for my child, I should take her to an MRI which required me to remove her from school all day and for Jewish holidays, which are, by the way, not an optional practice in my home, whether or not she would be penalized in her composite score for observing religious practice and receiving an MRI in the fall. I sent four emails and I finally had to go to Penn North to shake and bake to get someone to answer my question. Still to this day, there is nothing in the choice guide that answers questions for those parents. So I don't care what those slide sets says. The reason that the percentage is falling from 98% to 70 is because no one answers your questions here and the quality of information received from school to school is extremely variable. You are putting it all on the backs of parents to navigate what is the confusing, difficult, challenging process and then you're sending rejection letters to 10 year old children like they were tiny adults getting ready for the college process. Okay. This is not a developmentally appropriate way to run a school system and I urge you to think strongly about what changes you need to make. Thank you. And I believe um, we don't have anyone. Uh, is there no we don't have anyone else and I think we have actually come to the end of our time I want to thank everyone uh, thank those of you who came to uh, for uh, public comment and we will we will take to heart uh, what we have heard today thank all staff and folks who have presented for us and our meeting is adjourned <laughs>